Shalom, let's try this again. I don't, I just think there's been a lot of attack today. Well, it's going to be good then. Um, Shabbat Shalom. This is Beit, our Beit Rafa broadcast this evening. And uh, uh, anyway, welcome. We're going to have our, uh, our Friday night uh, broadcast here. I, uh, I apologize that we were, uh, I was uh, late coming on. I had a terrible, I had just a terrible physical attack today. I was in bed and, and then about, uh, I, I said, well, I'm not going to be able to, I guess I'm not going to be able to do it for the first time. And, and uh, you know, we've gone every day for nearly 60 days now, which is a first for me, for sure. But uh, 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 about about half hour after I posted, so well, then suddenly uh, I think y'all were praying, and and of course I was, but uh, suddenly the the power of God hit me, and uh, my strength came back, my stomach started bo stopped bothering me, and the Lord said, "Get dressed." So I did. So here I am. I'm still kind of, you know, I yes, you have to mix your faith with it, but but I just suddenly. Here I am. So I didn't miss today after all. Just a little late. I apologize. A little late on the on the East Coast, but that's okay. That's okay. It's this is this is Shabbat and this is the era of Shabbat or the, the night beginning Shabbat. So and I had put music on, I had set everything up, and then, then the whole thing just just went haywire, the signal. So we're back now. I think it's okay. This is music from my CD. Uh, my latest CD is uh, Rejoice O Israel. This, uh, the release of this coincided exactly with the uh, 70th anniversary uh, of, of uh, Israel and when the embassy was opened as well in Jerusalem a couple years ago. And so... And this is the Shema to begin. Praise the Lord. Well, hallelujah. Hope you're doing well tonight. I want to receive uh, the Kiddush, the communion. And so we're just going to go right, uh, we're going to go right to that. And uh, like I said, I, I, feel, I feel good. I feel really good. Well, let me say hello to a few people here before we do that. I, that's always nice to do, isn't it? And let's see. Who, who made it here after all that? Carol Elson, bless you. And Barb Ellis, yes, bless you, dear. Kathy Childers, bless you. Blake Frederick, shalom. Rabbi Maurice, yes. And, and uh, the Lord's teaching me to say, <laughs> say uh, I am Rabbi Maurice Sklar. So that just means teacher. And, and that, and I am, I am a teacher, and and I've been, God has asked me to 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 start an online uh, congregation, if you will. Of course, I don't know much what that is, so I'm learning. I'm learning, and we're learning as we go. And I know that I'm there. Are a lot of people that I would have chosen other than me. I told God that, but He never listens to that. He said, no, I want you to do this. So I'm just obeying him. That's what I'm doing. But we've had some wonderful, uh, wonderful nights. It feels like a revival every night. It's so, so wonderful. So uh, this is Hatikva, or the uh, Israeli National Anthem. Actually, uh, I have to tell you um, that uh, Devorah just... Uh, said that uh, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Burness, a Jewish voice, they're going to be doing this big interactive uh, broadcast. I think it's with CBN and Day, I don't know, or Daystar, I don't, some big TV thing. I, I, I don't know, I didn't want, but anyway, I'm going to be playing Hatik for, for uh, Shavuot that's coming up. We're getting close towards, uh, you know, we've been counting the Omer for a while and we're we're getting getting pretty close, another couple of weeks, and we're going to be coming into 
Hallelujah. This wonderful time of, of the beginning of the wheat harvest, the next festival. Uh, and uh, uh, Shavuot or Pentecost. And of course, there's a lot, and we were talking about that last week, a lot of parallels to and fulfillments in the Old and in, in the New Testament. Let me say hello. Hello, John and John Milky and Roger Levitt. Yes, good to see you, Roger. And John, you're so faithful, always there. Mike Thomas, bless you. Joanne Peace, yes. Hallelujah. Emily Strickland, Schneider Strickland. Beautiful. She has two beautiful, uh, beautiful girls. I, I've been, was praying in their seating. God's, God's really giving you guys a breakthrough. I've been saying that every day, but I, he, he, I, I know that. Debbie Davis. Yes, I'm glad I'm feeling better too. It really was. Uh, it really was a, a, a sudden, uh, supernatural. I mean, God just raised me up. You guys, I bet there's some mighty intercessors. You guys are just praying for me. The fire of God, power of God hit me and just said, get up. I said, yes, sir. And then I was okay. One, I had to get up, though. That's interesting. I had to get up. and I said, all right, I'm getting up because it was so strong. And then when I got up, all the symptoms left me. And that's the way it should be. Of course, I'd rather not have it in the first place. Well, hello there, Miss Rebecca Wadsworth Diallo. Good to see you. Yes, thank you. I, uh, you were on with us last night too. I am feeling better, Barb. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricky and Ginger. Always there. So, so uh, faithful. It says bring them on camera. I don't know. Are you on camera? I hope so. If you're not, send me a little note. Emily, yes, Emily, and glad. Glad to see you too, John, and I'm back. I'm back. Isn't this a beautiful, I um, wish you could see this prayer shawl. This was given to me a few years ago. Here, I'll stand up. Uh, isn't that beautiful? It's, uh, this was a gift to me, and then the Lord reminded me, and I said it's a whole lot more colorful. It's just a, I wear the talit, because God asked me to, on, uh, we're going to do that on the, on the, I'm going to do that on the uh, Sabbath and uh, holidays, uh, just like a, a, a rabbi would. Uh, of course, technically, it should be worn on Saturday morning. But I'm not very good with technical things. You probably figured that out by now. I, I don't. I, I, I'm learning, and I'm, and you know what? I'm reading, and I'm studying, and I'm asking God, show me how. You want me to do this because I could copy other people, but I gotta be me, you know. I just uh, and I'm a I'm a definitely a hybrid, a combo. I came into this whole uh, Jewish thing backwards anyway, but I since have discovered that I I come from a a, a, a line of priests or whatever you know, rabbis and you know uh, very uh, devout I the Lord gave showed me by revelation some of my family and because I don't know I mean uh, most the, of the the Jews that came over from uh, the pale Russia and Eastern Europe uh, my great-grandparents came over about 1896 something like that uh, right before the turn of the century there's no record, there's no gene genealogy that I can find uh, before that. Now, I have a grandmother, not, not that any of this has any spiritual whatever, hoop de doo I'm just saying that, but the Lord showed me, he said there is a generational, this pull, it's been like a tractor beam on my spirit, if you will, this pull into uh, this realm, and I'm still just on the edge of it. So y'all bear with me and probably five years from now, I'm going to have come a long way and I'll be able to understand what I'm supposed to do a little bit more, but I'm doing what I know to do, what little I know. Hallelujah. So anyway, the, uh, uh, uh but on my, my grandmother on my father's side is the only one that was not from, uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. She was English and she was not Jewish, but she now one night. Devorah got on the Ancestry.com and she started 
clicking, you know, the little leaves and then one and then another, another, another. And and it turns out I come in, in her line, her her name was Hyer, H-Y-E-R. She was one of the first families to settle in New Jersey, in northern New Jersey, Keyport. Uh, and then uh, uh, she, uh, uh, New York, New Jersey. Well, she, her family came here about in the 1600s, the 1600s, 1700s, right? Some of the first people to come to America. And they, they were, uh, she was from a Dutch reform background, very devout lady. I've never, I never met her. She died when my dad was seven. Uh, mysteriously, we don't quite understand. But uh, she, I don't know why I'm sharing this, uh, uh, divorce started with the hires, and then she got to the, uh, another family, prominent English family, and that family was the Herbert family. And then the Herbert family is connected with, you know, that Daunton Abbey uh, house? There's actually an Earl that I, I'm i in a, you know, there's some, and then because of that, they kept such meticulous records in Great Britain and England. It goes back into this line all the way back. Then you go into the Merrill, the French, the Franks, and then, the Merovingian, the kings, and 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 it's a it's a royal line, and and Devorah said, all the way back to two hundred years before Yeshua, isn't that amazing? I said, come on, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, she says, oh, I know it's true. You you know, no wonder you act like that. <laughs> so I'm maybe I'm a maybe I'm a king or something, way back there somewhere, you know. Uh, I wish I was closer to the, you know, I wish there was something there for real, but anyway, God knows. It's interesting. He keeps track of everything, and there is something to a generational blessing, just like there's a generational curse, generational curses that pass. Uh, but God always remembers, he always remembers the the faithfulness. Remember in the of the fathers. Uh, you remember uh, Phineas in the Bible was the man that, that in his zeal, he, he, he uh, killed the couple that were in the, you know, in the tent and doing what they shouldn't do. And, you know, and, and God said to him, he said, Phineas is Pincus. Pincus is the Hebrew way of saying Phineas. Uh, and he was, you know, one of the Old Testament guys that was very zealous for God. Well, uh, he uh, uh, he's remembered. He says he'll be remembered forever because of what he did. You know, well, God has a way of remembering things, and I and uh, keeping track and rewarding even generationally. So, it we're going to be it's going to be interesting on that day to find out all the answered prayer of why. You who who you are, what happened to you, why you why you wound up where you God answers prayer and he says, I remember my covenant to a thousand generations. If he gives a promise to somebody, he remembers it. And so very often uh these blessings are well they are, they they are passed from generation to generation. So sometimes God will have you honor like I'm doing. He said, I want you to honor the faithfulness of your fathers by uh, keeping your Jewish identity even in the church. Now, I don't consider myself outside of the church. Some uh, Messianic Jews, you know, they, or whatever we want to call it, um, you know, Hebrew, Christian, Jewish roots, whatever, there's all kinds of different interpretations. Try to stay out of that as best you can. Remember, the church is a good thing. It's not... I'm a part of the church. And what cleared this up for me, we were on a cruise with uh, the couple from Jewish Jewels, Neil and Jamie Lash. Uh, Neil passed just recently, but, and I just love them. They're just, and we were sitting and talking, and one of, I think it was the last thing, we had a dinner, and one of the last things Rabbi Neil said to me was, he said, uh, I'm a part of the church. I don't consider myself separate from the church. But I'm a Jew, the Jewish, I'm part of the Jewish part of the church, see? And then you're safe. You're safe doctrinally. You're safe. It's okay. God, the, the New Testament never tells the Jew he has to stop being a Jew. 
uh, Paul didn't stop being a Jew. He said, I am a Jew. He didn't say I was a Jew and now I'm a new creation. He said, I am a Jew. That was his. And, and okay, that there's something eternal in that. Now I am a new creation. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male or female. Now, so I ask you, have you stopped being male or female since you became a new creation? Well, no, because we're not just spirit beings. In the spirit, we are one. We are made new. But we're also natural beings, just like uh, a Chinese Christian wouldn't stop being Chinese or a, a, a Brazilian or whatever heritage you are. And, and because we are both natural beings and spiritual beings. And God has, but God has a special eternal place for the natural children of Abraham and those that have served him, even in the old covenant. And God is revealing some of these mysteries now. And some people get very nervous about that. Bless their darling hearts. They get nervous. How can you just stop, stop all that stuff. Just become a nice nice uh i remember when i lived in tulsa uh, tulsania tulsa oklahoma and i came into this i was just secular i didn't know i didn't know god from a hole in the wall and i just got saved and but i come from a jewish background but i wasn't raised that way my parents divorced i, I was very uh very liberal parents uh no no religious background whatsoever really except there was this nagging thing. I knew some, I couldn't, I just knew I was Jewish, but I didn't know what that meant. Uh, I was, so anyway, I come to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I have been, my life has been turned upside down because I got saved and I learned about you can live by faith, walk by faith, not by sight, you know, and I, uh, I, I was in the charismatic realm. I ended up teaching artist in residence at Oral Roberts University, which was the head of this kind of charismatic uh, faith teaching, especially at that at that time. Well, this is about 1990. Well, and you know, so I go to this amazing church. Uh, uh, when I got there, uh, and it was called Grace Fellowship. And I, I heard this man teach the Bible, and he got more content in to 15 minutes than I and Revelation than I'd ever heard. Any, he's a virtuoso teacher. You know, he was just, his name was Bob Yandian. So I go, and I, I said, wow, that was, that was amazing. And, and I came in, I, I, I met him, and you know, I, I shook his hand because he's greeting people. And, and, and we ended up going there for, for a while. Uh, until the Lord brought us over to Jerry Zirkel's church. But, so the first six months, a year or so, there I was, going to this church, and, you know, I didn't care about anything Jewish, but so the first day when I met him, I, I shook his hand, and it just, just left out of my mouth. Uh, I was praying in tongues a lot at that time, so maybe it, I said, well, hello, I'm, I'm a... a this is, uh, I'm Maurice Glar, this is Debbie, and this is, you know, uh, it's, it's my daughter. Hello, we're the Sklars, hello. And he says, hello, hello. And then I said, I, I just said, I said, oh, uh, I'm, I'm a Jewish believer. I don't know why I said that. I had nothing, it was, I wasn't even thinking about any of that. It just kind of, I said, and he goes, oh, well, that's great. I'm an Oklahoma believer. And for him, that was just, yeah, okay, great. But for me, I felt like I was slapped. And I don't know why. I said, why did that bother me so much? There was something in that. What, what's wrong here? So this tension and this pull with, uh, with this Jewish thing in my life, which, like I said, it's been like a tractor beam on my uh, on 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 me, and so well. Then I was uh, uh, then I visited uh, when I was in school at Curtis. I visited uh, this Messianic congregation called Beth Yeshua a couple of times, but I sat in the back and and I it I, I said, well, that's 
different, you know, because they were they were Jewish and they were Messianic, and well, so I, well, I ended up somehow in the early '90s ministering at in Philadelphia at this uh, congregation, Beth Yeshua, and so I have I come in Friday afternoon, and then Friday night it was probably '92. I was just starting ministry, just very very, and and he goes, oh. Uh, the rabbi, David Chernoff, he goes, oh, well, we're having Shabbat dinner over at, at mo mom's or mother his at mother's house, <laughs> as we always do. Would you, would you like to come? I said, sure. I really didn't even know what it, I said, well, some kind of special Jewish dinner or something. So, okay. So I go over there. I sit down in, in that, in, in their beautiful dining room. Their whole family was there, you know relatives and I mean, you know, it was a pretty big dinner. Uh, and uh, uh, I didn't know anybody. I was kind of uncomfortable. I said, what? And they immediately started asking me, oh, so you're, oh, so you're Jewish. <laughs> I, said, I said, well, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm really a, really, I'm a Tulsanian faith Christian, but I didn't say that, but that's what I felt like. I was, if I, if there was a, uh, Kenneth Hagen faith flag. I would have, and there is probably. But I mean, I'd make, I'd made underwear out of it. I'm faith man. I'm new, you know. I'm total, and I still am. I mean, that's I love the message of faith. I feed on that. That's my life. Brought me up out of depression, and and kept me, and now is manifesting total victory in my life. It's just wonderful. So anyway, so there, I'm there, and and anyway, I ministered, and and. I recognized I was way too churchy for them. And they were kind of uncomfortable, but they loved my music. And I, oh no, it was a little later, it was a few years later, because I had I, I had probably had the, my, the, the Songs of Zion CD come out. Well, so they, lo they knew of me for my music, so I just mainly played a concert there and tried to behave myself and try to be Jewish or whatever that meant. I didn't, you know. So anyway, then, uh, but David, when I get on the plane, he right before, he gives me this book. Rabbi David, he said, here, this is a book. It's a purple book written by my father. It was purple cover, and it said Yeshua on it, Yeshua. And I, he said, here, read this. So on the way back on the plane, I read it, and God hit me. But then I tried to struggle to get out of that. I tried to squirm to get out. <laughs> Uh, I I really, I still didn't quite understand, but oh my gosh, the Lord said, your Jewishness, you are Jewish. I said, well, not anymore. Look, it says I'm a new creation. There's neither Jew nor Greek. And I, I you know, so I, I stuffed it down again. And uh, for the next eight, 10 years, uh, I, I kind of, it was like trying to keep a, a cork under the water, you know. I, you know, so, and then in 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 '95, I did this uh, outreach with Sid Roth. This is before he had his television program. I did prophesy he would go on television, uh, and in, uh, I remember that we were in Boca Raton, Florida. And I, but I used to do a few. I, I came on his radio program. He had an interview, and then uh, he had a, a, a. We had met at a Rodney Howard Brown summer camp meeting in '93, and so he started to have me. We went up to Brooklyn and we did an outreach. He's an amazing evangelist to the Jews. So, so I'd play and he'd speak. Uh, then we went up to Montreal and we did it up there and got kicked out of the park or something. Uh, the Orthodox uh, ran after us. And then we were up in Toronto and then we were, uh, and we wound up in Colorado doing this, uh, 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 doing this conference it was a teaching conference, but it was on Jew something about Jewish roots. So uh, I think, no, no, the man invited both of us. I think that's what happened. So we were in a joining uh, hotel right next to each other, not adjoining, but our hotel rooms were right next to each other. We came back after the morning meeting and Sid looked at me and goes, you know, you should wear, you should wear a kippah when you go on with, you know, since you're on with Benny Hinn, I said. Akiva, why? You're Jewish. You should. It's a, it's a sign, you know. 
And I, I was polite, but I said, well, no, no, thank you. I, I mean, or whatever. Uh, and uh, I think he even offered me one. I think he gave me one that he had. Here, why don't you wear it for these? Because I'm playing all this Jewish music and the uh, integrity music had marketed me as messianic, even though I really wasn't very messianic. So because Paul Wilbur wanted me for his... Uh, Shalom Jerusalem. So all of this kind of came together. So it kind of, I, 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 but I was uncomfortable with it. So then I got into my hotel room and the Lord spoke to me so strong. He said, I'd appreciate it if you would wear that. I said, why? Why? What, what does this have to do? Don't I have enough problems? You know, do I have to do that too? You know, Rodney won't like, nobody will like it. Benny might throw me, get upset. I don't know what, what, what's going to happen here. I'm playing with all these charismatics. They, they, he, he said, I want you to wear it from now on. I said, God. You know, I argued. Jews argue. We argue with God most of the time, but he always wins. But I, I finally said, uh, you mean from now on? He said, yes, when you minister, not when you're living, just when you minister. I said, why? And I heard it as clear as a bell. God said, I want you to do it because you love me. But he said, I want you to do it to obey, to, to obey me. It's because I want you to. I said, you want me to. Why do you want me to? He said two reasons, to honor the faith of your fathers and to be a prophetic sign to the church that I am not done with Israel yet. And I'll never be done with Israel, but I'm not done with Israel. So from then on, because God spoke so strong, I said, okay, I'll do it like Reese Howells wore his hat. If you if you read his book Intercessor, it, towards the end of the book, uh, Reese Howells has a, a, a these are all charismatic books. This is a powerful book on. He was an intercessor, you know, back in before Daunting Abbey times, you know, in uh, in Wales or Scotland or wherever he was. I think it was England, but it was in those days. You had to wear a hat at certain times, and then sometimes you. You cannot wear a hat. And it was a social thing. It was a big, big hoop de doo about it. When to wear hats, when not to wear. Well, God would have him to bear this prayer burdens, you know, and, and he would go through and he, God asked him to do special things and intercede. And I, I don't understand that totally, but I, I've experienced that. I, I'm doing the same thing. Uh, he said, he said, uh, he told him not to wear a hat in church, or when he, or wear a hat in church, and not wear a hat when he was in the, when he was supposed to. And you know, it caused all kinds of, you know, huh, you know, who, you know, hump, hump. A lot of the hoity-toities of the Victorian era didn't like that. There was proper times to wear hats, and there was proper times not to wear hats. Well. So it's not, it's not like a religious thing, but it's an obedience thing. And, and then through a process of time, took maybe 10 years or so, God kept leading me and leading me step by step. He said, I don't want you to lose what you have. I want you to take what I've given you and bring both worlds together, but don't lose either one. I said, that's a real balancing act. How am I going to do that? He says, I'll help you. And so that's where I am today. <laughs> so that's why I'm trying to tell you, I may not be as, I, 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 obviously, I've come at this the opposite way. So y'all have to pray for me. But I, I want to stay in the, the, the stream of the Ruach HaKodesh, the stream of the Holy Spirit in this realm. And I believe in the new covenant. I believe we're supposed to live in the new covenant. But there's this realm of the kingdom that God is restoring. He's restoring the glory of the old and the new. And it's together we'll see the fullness. 
And, and so this is a transition time. And that's why, that's why I'm doing my best to do what he asked me. So I come to you as a rabbi in obedience to God, because he said, I want, I want that. <sighs> Can I just be brother? Can I just, you know, I tell you who I like, believe it or not, I love the Pentecostals, not the crazy ones, but the historic ones, the, the real, I mean, the Gwen Shaw types, you know, the, uh, the uh, 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 Reese Howells types, the, the ones, the, the, the great, uh, the great John G. Lake came out of the Pentecostal move before there was a charismatic faith. He lived it. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth lived it, uh, and many others. Those are, you know, and great missionaries. Those are my heroes. I mean, even denominational people that really obey God. If you obey God, you're my hero. And God will always pull you outside of the box somehow. If you're totally in a box and you're comfortable, I doubt you're doing much for God. Because religion will put you in a box and close the lid and... and uh, tie you up and leave you there sitting on a pew for 40 years. But I don't want that. Uh, I, I, so anyway, we all, if we will all be uniquely, God likes variety. He doesn't make everybody the same. Isn't that wonderful? Can you imagine if we were all Baptists? Can you imagine that? In heaven, my God. You know, I think he made the Jews because he likes to laugh, you know, or he made, he makes different people all different. I love, I love the Africans when they start to dance and sing. And I love the, the Chinese believers and, and, and the Koreans who can pray heaven down and don't stop. Uh, and the, uh, you know, but God has chosen us to be who we are. I love the Scandinavians with their frozen chosen, but they get when they get on fire, my goodness. The, when the Swedes got on fire in the 90s up in Uppsala, the town that sounds like a mistake. Uppsala. <laughs> I mean, you talk about on fire. Yeah, I was shaped by that move of God I, and, and others. Uh, so, hallelujah, that's good. Let's celebrate all the different parts of the body instead of trying to cram us in to one. And then Messianic Jews don't fit anywhere and they're always trying to fit. That's probably what I'm doing, talking, rambling, ranting. I'm not ranting, I am, I, but rambling. Because I have to, I have to, I can't be pulled into somebody's box. It just doesn't work. So everybody has to put up with me. Oi, oi ve. <laughs> but God accepts me, and I gotta be me, I gotta be me. And that's who I'm going to remain, amen. Well, let's receive, that was a, that probably was a rant or ramble or, or, or rambling around, or, but that's okay, I hope. You know, the wonderful thing about this, these broadcasts, I mean, I feel great right now. I feel so strong and full of joy and no symptoms and my head isn't pounding, my stomach isn't about to throw up. Hallelujah. It just left me. Boom. See, you can, you don't have to stay sick. No, but you have to stand sometimes. It's a war. Oh, but I'm so glad y'all prayed me, pulled me through. So we're gonna receive now the Kiddush. So I'm gonna say the blessing. Was that all right? Did you enjoy that? Hallelujah. Do you have your elements with you? The bread and the wine? Yeshua said to do this as often. I believe it's as often as you can. So I said, why not every day? I heard, uh, I call her Lady Rose, Rose Weiner. Remember when she taught on communion? She'd been telling me that for years, but I just kind of, I said, yeah, okay, yeah, that's nice. Until I realized, wait a minute, the presence with a capital P is in the communion. That, oh yeah, God always comes. And hallelujah. So, 
Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. This is how Yeshua blessed the bread and the wine. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Bore Pari Hagafen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Thank you, dear Lord. I give you praise. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeshua said, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat it. Receive. I am the bread of heaven. Receive resurrection life into your body into your soul into your spirit he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes we are healed i am healed i'm here today because jesus bore my sickness even this very day and he took it from me hallelujah so let's receive Shalom, the wholeness of the life of God. Take and eat. This is the body of Messiah, the Christ, broken for you. Hallelujah. sun is just starting to go down right now. Now, in the future, Lord willing, and if he helps me and if y'all pray, <laughs> I want us to actually light the candles. I want Devora to to come on and we're going to have we're going to have uh, I want to have Shabbat dinner. You know, I mean, I don't know how you do that, but at least we can have the have that part of it and, and have her come on and pray and light the candles and bless everybody. Hallelujah. You bless your wife. You bless your children. You bless, you receive, the, you give and receive the blessing of the Shabbat. Hallelujah. The blessing. And I might just, you know what? I'm, I'm headed that direction too. We're going to do that. But anyway, hallelujah. glory to God. Yeshua said, this is my blood. This is the new covenant in my blood shed for you. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood and the life of heaven, my life, I give for you. Hallelujah. This is the cup of redemption. This is poured out for you for the remission of sin, of your sin, to cover your sin. I take a, a, a bath every day or a, I, or a shower. I wash, I receive washing every day in the spirit. Every day. This is just once every once in a while. Every day I, I receive, I, I ask God to wash me in his blood, the blood of Yeshua, and to wash me in the water of the word. That's how we stay whole and cleansed and pure before God. Receive. <laughs> Receive the blood of Messiah. Pour it out for you. Jesus redeemed the whole world. A reconciled man to himself, the mighty Redeemer. Blessed be he, Mashiach. Son of David, Son of God, soon coming, King of glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. L'chaim. Hallelujah. Well, now on the, uh, <coughs> on the weekends, I want to, I want to read a story. <laughs> Remember, I started this a couple weeks ago. This is Devorah's book, Shlomo's Stories. Shlomo Karlbach, 
Carly Bach was Devorah's rabbi. Now she, in New York, she, for 10 years, she was very close with him. And uh, I feel a connection to him, even though I never got to meet him. He passed before I met her. But this was a very special man. I don't think there's ever been anyone like him. He's probably, he, his, he would sing until God came. He just worshiped God, worshiped God, just like David. And he wrote almost all the songs that the Jewish world sings today. He came, he really rose up about the same time as the charismatic movement. And he was, he, he just breathed life into Jews all over the world and brought them back to God uh, in a very similar way that, that a, a Christian evangelist would bring a revivalist would call people back call people back to to the church and get on fire well he was like that for the jews and he take his guitar and sing all over the world well i had no idea uh who he was but uh, uh i i learned more about it it turns out this man was uh, uh i believe he was a true Tzaddik. A, a tzaddik is a, 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 a Jewish, usually a rabbi, that has been touched in a special way by the Almighty uh, to, to uh, bring what we would call the anointing in uh, the Christian world. It is the anointing. It's a presence of the Holy Spirit. Just see, anointing is not a, didn't start with Jesus. Actually, he bore the mantle and anointing of Elijah. That's where the miracles came for, came out of that same flow. Of course, they came. Uh, he he was he was God manifest in the flesh. He was perfect in those, but he did all those miracles and all those supernatural things as a man, not as God, as a man, totally dependent on the Holy Spirit, so that he could be our example. That's why he can say the same works that I do, shall you do. So, anyway, Shlomo was an amazing man. And I first, I met him, if you will, the same time I met Devora. We were, uh, it was in uh, nearly 17 years ago now. Uh, and we met in New York City, uh, Pastor Benny had a big meeting in Madison Square Garden, and uh, and we had somehow connected. I had been through a terrible separation, and I was I I was broken person, but uh, she was this New York Jewish believer. She got saved a couple years before new believer, uh, uh, but she was absolutely steeped in. In, in the, I mean, just saturated with the, the world of 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 uh, Shlomo Shlomo Karlbach and the the Jewish. Uh, she was very. She kept a kosher home. I mean, everything. She was very. She did all that stuff. She was very religious. So I learned a lot about that, and I was extremely drawn to that part of her when we met. Well, we got, we were walking and we were out on the West Side Pier. She had taken me out for, for, uh, she had taken me out for uh, uh, breakfast at Barney Greengrass on the West Side, which is this hole in the wall with green formica chairs and tables and, you know, probably had been there since the 60s and just, but had the best had the best, I mean, it was, you know, it was Jewish central. I mean, all these old Jews go in there and, you know, and, and, and amazing locks. And she ordered latkes and fed it to me. And that's Jewish kryptonite right there. There's no defense. <laughs> I fell like a ton of bricks. <laughs> I fell for her when she fed me those latkes with applesauce on it. Mm-hmm. And something about this just, I realized, wow, there's something here that I never had. And I want it. And I liked her. And I still like her so much. I'm more in love now than I was before. 
Has it been always easy? No. I tell you what, God knows who we need, doesn't he? Hallelujah. Anyway, so uh, then we went on the West Side Pier. This was a Saturday. Shabbat was Sabbath. So we went out and uh, uh, she had this Arcos. It was the predecessor of the, uh, the, the iPod. Remember the iPod, you know, it was a was the first, one of the first MP3 players. It was Arcos, Arcos, Arcos. And this box thing. And she said, listen to this. And we were walking on the pier there. And she put the little Walkman headphones in there. And I, and I started hearing. She said, this is my rabbi, listen to him. Started hearing this man sing. And he went, I don't know. And suddenly, I nearly fell off the pier because I, I, I wanted to fall on my knees. And I said, my God, my God, what an anointing. That's what Pastor Benny would say. <laughs> but it was something came from deep, 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 deep. And it began to pull out of me something in my spirit that I said, who is this man? I haven't heard anybody carry, I never experienced that. What is that? He said, well, he was a very special <laughs> psalmist. He was, he was a Jewish psalmist. So, uh, you know, and I, I, he may have been a secret believer. I think uh, Ruth Heflin said she testified she prayed and led him to Messiah right on, on it uh, you know when when towards the end of his life but i believe he probably you know a man like that walked with messiah he just didn't know maybe who he was but the you know but he was very very jewish very orthodox very uh hasidic hasidic chabad type chabad is a different of course there's different like denominations in judaism but but they are really alive to god and he God used him to awaken so many, and they still revere him through it. So you ever want to listen to some amazing music? Shlomo Karbalat. So anyway, he used to tell stories, though. He was just like grandpa. He was like dad, uh, you know, grandpa. And he would tell stories. He would say, God is the greatest storyteller of all. And so he said, and of course, Yeshua also told stories, he told parables, and God, and he said the Bible is just a book of stories. <laughs> but what stories? Because you learn through stories. So and so these are Hasidic tales or ha uh, mystical uh, tales of the fathers of the great, the great, um, my great, great, great grandparents, okay, probably, you know, and, and before that uh, the Baal Shem Tov was one of the, the tzaddiks that s started the Hasidic movement. And this is a story about the Baal Shem, uh, the, the, the father of the, and Hasidics are, you know, the ones with the black hats and the payas, and they have different, they have different sects, but they're followers of different rabbis, basically what we call ultra-Orthodox. Well, some of them are can be mean, I know. I've met some really nasty, mean ones, but I've met some that they look at you and you're, you, it looks like Yeshua looking at you. He was that kind. Uh, it was uh, pure love, just. All right, so this story, where the Baal Shem mistreats a Jew. This is one of Shlomo's stories. Everybody knows that Israel, Ben Eliezer, the holy Baal Shem, taught his Hasidim, his students, his Talmudim, Hasidim, to be sweet, never to hurt anyone's feelings. God forbid you should be, God forbid you should be coarse and insensitive. If so, then you might keep Shabbos wrapped 15 pairs of tefillin on your arms and head, but you would never be holy. Well, that sounds like the trappings of Christian religion, too. I, I've met a whole lot of Christian 
I mean, some of the meanest, nastiest people I've ever met are so-called Christians, just in the flesh, not in the spirit. Mm -hmm. We all can be like that. We don't want to be, though. One Wednesday, the holy Baal Shem Tov announced to ten of his Hasidim, Harness the horses and let's start riding. We're going someplace else for Shabbos. The group left Medsifboza and drove, that this is a town, I couldn't quite pronounce it, probably in Russia, and drove from, or, or Poland, probably, and drove for many hours. They just reached a little village when the holy Val Shem Tov signaled for them to stop before a fallen down shack. The roof was in disrepair, the windows were broken, and it was raining. It was raining in, snowing in, blowing. Nonetheless, a cute Yiddish, uh, 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 Jewish child, uh, Mr. Sweetness himself, but obviously the poorest Jew in the region, or not a child, it's just a young Jewish man, a Yiddish, uh, came out to greet them. Guests, this is the greatest honor in the world. Please come in. As the Val Shem Tov was climbing off the wagon, he turned to his students and whispered, No matter what happens, don't tell this man that I am the Val Shem Tov. That's like the Pope, <laughs> you know, or it was a very high, uh, uh, high position he was in. One of the Hasidim nodded yes, but before the Yidla could ask another question, the Val Shem Tov interrupted them. Why so much talk? Can't you see we're starving and want something to eat? The Hasidim were really shocked. The man was obviously a good man, but poor. How could their teacher speak so harshly to him? The Yiddua, without questioning him, then further ran ahead into his house. As the Val Shem and all his Hasidim entered after him, they heard the Yiddua in the kitchen say to his wife, Serala, the highest honor in the world is ours. We have 11 Yidden here from Medzivboz, and we must offer them some dinner. But we have nothing. We have milk. We have the milk from the cow. That milk is for our children. And the little bread we have left from Sh Shabbos is for them also. Moshe the Yidala answered, I don't care. Our guests come first. So Moshe and his wife serve their guests the bread and milk. The Hasidim knew that Moshe was taking food away from his children so they wouldn't eat. But the Val Shem Tov made himself at home and ate everything in sight. Whatever they left on the table, he ate, stuffing the food into his mouth until there was nothing left. The Hasidim couldn't believe their eyes. They felt very bad for the Yiddo and ashamed of their master. The next morning, the Val Shem Tov woke up early and said, hey, where's breakfast? Again, Moshe and his wife brought the milk and bread intended for their children. The Hasidim took only a little and Moshe, at, and at Moshe's insistence just to be polite, but the Baal Shem Tov finished off the whole meal. And afterward, he said to Moshe, I'm really hungry. I'll need a decent meal tonight. You got any meat in this house? The Yiddler ran to the kitchen. I have to offer a decent meal to the 11 Yidden. His wife was upset. The only meat we have is the cow. But we can't slaughter the cow, Moshe, to feed 11 strangers. We won't have any more milk for our children. <coughs> Moshe replied, we can and we will. These people are my guests and I want to treat them right. So he went and slaughtered the cow himself. 
and the Baal Shem Tov, before all his Hasidim, managed to devour the whole cow <laughs> the Thursday night when they sat down to dine, to dine. By Friday, there was nothing left but the bones. Then the Baal Shem called in the Yidla, Listen, Moshe, I want to give you my menu for Shabbos. Everybody knows that on Shabbos we offer a special, more extravagant feast than during the week. The Hasidim didn't know what Moshe would do. He had nothing left. They felt terrible for this poor man who was so sweet. Yet no one had the chutzpah to ask the Baal Shem Tov why he didn't show more respect for the man who was obviously in great need. The Baal Shem Tov said to his host, I need 12 challahs, 12 loaves of bread, 12 loaves of bread for Shabbos and three kinds of wine, two fishes, sweet and sour, and soup for every meal, chicken as a main course, and cake for dessert. And I expect you to have all this brought and prepared by Shabbos. The Yidua went back into the kitchen and asked his wife, what am I going to do? We've got to give our guests something special for Shabbos. I have no idea, his wife replied. We've slaughtered the cow already. What do we have left? There's no other way. I'll have to sell the house. <laughs> are you crazy? We have children. Where are we going to live? We'll deal with that later. Right now our guests come first. The Yidua went into the village and sold his house. He arranged with the local banker that he could remain on the premises until Monday night. Let's face it, how much can you get from a broken down house worth only its weight in firewood? Just enough for three meals of Shabbos. This the Baal Shem and his Hasidim knew. When they sat down to the table for their first meal on Friday night, the Hasidim would rather have fasted a hundred years than eat, to eat, than eat food procured at another's expense. But the Baal Shem Mamash started with the soup and kept right on eating. The Hasidim couldn't take their eyes off him. This is our Rebbe. Everything he taught us not to do, he's doing. Shabbos passed and it was time to go. The Hasidim wanted to leave immediately they saw only too well the pain of Moisha's wife, her anxiety for the, the fate of her family. But the Baal Shem wouldn't leave until absolutely every crumb of the feast was gone. By Sunday night, there was nothing left on the table or in the kitchen. The Hasidim felt so bad a man and his family without house or food. And when the holy Baal Shem gave the signal, they raced to the wagon, eager to get away. The Baal Shem Tov came slowly behind his students, waved farewell and climbed up onto the wagon seat. The whole time, can you believe, he had not uttered one word of thank you to Moshe for his hospitality. All he did as the wagon pulled away was to turn around and shout to Moshe, I want you to know that I am the Baal Shem Tov. All the way back to Medziboz, the Hasidim were silent. They felt they could never forgive the Rebbe for that Shabbos. Meanwhile, Standing before his house, Moshe began to realize his fate. Tomorrow, I have to move out. I have nowhere to go. There's no food in the house. My family is starving. What am I going to do? One thing was for sure. He couldn't go into the kitchen and consult with his wife because Sarala wasn't speaking to him. So as he often did when he had a problem, Moisha ran into the forest to hide. <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> he sat down under his favorite tree and began crying to God, Master of the universe, I slaughtered the cow. 
and sold the house just to fulfill your will. But now I have nothing. Please, God, I don't know what to do. Have compassion on my family. Never mind me. My wife and my family need food and shelter. That was only beginning. That was only the beginning of Moishala's prayer. Perhaps you know that when you pray, your soul expands. Well, Moisha, Moisha's soul grew wings. The little Yidla began to think, if only I were rich, if I was, were a rich man, if only I were rich, then I could have as many people for Shabbos as wanted or needed to come without worrying about how I would feed them. So he said more to God, Master of the universe, if you would just make me rich, what I wouldn't do for you in honor of Shabbos, I'd have, I'd have hundreds of guests and I'd offer them the finest of feasts. Then filled with desperation and doubt, have you ever given down to where there's no more to give? Boy, that's a, that's a place for miracles. Always a place for miracles. Because God is very real. You can't outgive him. I've been there. I've given everything I could possibly know to give. What am I going to do now? You ever been there? Oh, that's a good place to be. Because then you, it just opens you up. See, you have to open a space in your heart to receive by giving. See? That's what, that's what, if we ever empty our own hands, where God's able to fill them. Anyway, that, that just came hot off the press. I didn't, uh, okay, show me what to do. And Moisha started for home. This, oh no, sorry. Uh, then filled with desperation and doubt as he remembered the troubles that awaited him at home, the Yidla put on one last appeal, put in one last appeal. Please, God, I'm begging you, spare my family. This has all been my fault. Please, God, show me what to do. And Moisha started for home. On his way, he ran into Ivan, the city drunkard, who greeted him very warmly. Hey, Moisha, I've been looking all over the village for you. We have to talk. Have you seen how my children abuse me? They treat me like a dog, call me a drunkard, and a good for nothing. They have no respect. The only person in the world who has treated me like a real human being, Moisha, is you. So I've decided to share a secret with you. I may look like a nothing, but I am a very wealthy man. I have thousands upon thousands of gold pieces buried in this forest, and I want to show you my hiding place. Because if I die, I want you to have them. At first, Moisha didn't believe him. But Ivan took him to a certain stump in the forest. And there, hidden in a hollow covered by a rock, was an immense treasure. Ivan showed him the gold. Then together, the two men walked home, feeling good. The next day, there was a th funeral in the town. Ivan the drunkard had died in the night. Moisha the Yidla became wealthy then, then and there, a multimillionaire with plenty of guests for Shabbos. <laughs> a year passed. In, Medze in Medzibos, the Hasidim could never quite look their Rebbe in the eye for the way he had treated Moisha. One day, Moisha's wife said to him, Moisha, the Val Shem Tov did all this for us in his crazy way, and we've never even said thank you or shared our good fortune with him. Let's go visit him. By this time, Moisha owned a beautiful carriage, a beautiful carriage with eight horses. <laughs> That's a great story. I like this. This is amazing. I never read it before, so I'm... I'm I'm <laughs> reading it with you <laughs> for the first time. Yeah. So, with he, Moisha now owned a beautiful carriage with eight horses. His children were very well dressed. Food they had in abundance. They didn't need milk from an old cow, so they packed some gifts and went to Medzibos to see the holy Baal Shem. 
when the carriage appeared before the home of the holy master, the ten Hasidim who had accompanied the Baal Shem that, Sha that Shabbos could not, that Shabbos who had accompanied the Baal Shem, that Shabbos could not believe their eyes. They recognized Moshe immediately and ran over to him with the warmest greetings. Shalom Aleichem, how are you doing? You won't believe it, but in these few months since I saw you, I've become extraordinarily rich. So we see what happened. Moshe told them the unbelievable story of Ivan's request. This obviously has to do with the way in which the Holy Baal Shem was behaving that Shabbos. Still, why did he have to be so gruff? They all went inside to meet the master. Moishra, Moishra, the Holy Baal Shem greeted him. Tell me exactly what happened since I left your house. So Moishra began with the story of Ivan's bequest. He recounted, how he had gone into the forest and prayed before God to make him rich. Here the holy Baal Shem interrupted him. You see, Moishra, you were poor, but heaven had decreed that you should be rich. You had only to ask, but you were too humble to ever think of your own needs. So I ate your cow and got you to sell your house in order to force you to cry out for what was rightfully yours. L'chaim! <laughs> That's a great story. Ah, I didn't know. I, you know, I honestly, God just said read them. I, I haven't read them to you. So I get to hear them when you hear them. Now, I've heard a number of his stories uh, that he's recorded. Uh, Moishless. But they're all stories from, from the old country. You know, they're just uh, kind of like fables or tales. But do you see? What a clear... What a clear picture of receiving from God and how great God is. He knows where everything is. Don't be afraid of anything. You need only ask. Isn't that beautiful? Well, that fit perfect today. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? You know, if we'll let the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, do what he wants every day, God paints a brand new picture on a new canvas. And it's just for today, you know, that's what God had. Religion, you, you can never, you can never get that unless you get out on the water and you just trust him. What, what, God, what do you have today? I mean, I think the devil did everything he could to keep me in bed because he didn't want me to share that with you. But hallelujah, see? God always wins, doesn't he? But God also is always, he can see things a lot different than we do. What a, what a parable, that, that, that story. And, you know, we don't really know what poverty is in America. They were in poverty. Uh, you know, I mean, you remember the, uh, 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 in those days, the, the 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 shtetls and the, the the life the fiddle on the roof that was a very actually pretty accurate picture of what most of European Jewry before the before the war and before also before the revolution uh, you know the 1917 revolution the Bolshevik and it it was you know the Jews were always always blamed for everything and you know. So this is, a, a, this is also a picture of what the ministry and the end. Yeah, I'm getting something now for you. This is something for the end times. Because you see, when we get to the place where we, where we understand God's going to, he always calls a man and he'll anoint that person. And how you treat, how you treat that person is God looks as as you're treating him. You see, when Jesus comes to you, he he comes to you in disguise. Don't ever despise a drunkard. Don't ever despise it. Don't you don't know. You don't know. God's got God's stuff hidden away. I mean, he's got all kinds of things. 
eye has not seen, ears not heard. But we've become so dependent on and and uh, on uh, our wits, and you know, and we've. This is the land of milk and honey here. I mean, in America, we have so much, and that came at the sacrifice of our uh, grand grands, great grandparents, those that went through the deprivation of. Can you imagine having to rebuild after the Civil War? Or can you imagine, um, you know, just think about the fires of Atlanta, you know, and you know, or whatever. You look at Gone with the Wind, you know. I mean, whatever, and, and all the suffering. Those that came through World War One and lost everything in Europe and had to rebuild, and then World War Two. I mean. See, we've never known in America, we've had 72 years and 120 years of, of unparalleled peace and prosperity. And there arose a generation that did not know war, didn't know God, didn't know war, didn't know what it's like to go through deprivation. We don't know in America, we have no idea. We, I include me. I not, I never, I never uh, had to miss a meal because there was no food. Maybe very few times. I mean, maybe a little bit, but no, not like, but half the world doesn't have enough food or clean water. So, so we have to become grateful for what we do have, first of all, and then start giving, giving of ourselves, giving us, getting outside of me, myself, and I. That is the great cry of the Ruach, the great cry of the Spirit right now. Let's enter into that bridal company that though you have so much, yet you lay it all down for Him. And I'm not, see, I'm not talking about money. Money is just a tool. I'm not, I'm talking about your heart, your time, your love, your, 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 it, it's all about loving other people. See, that's what it's about. So this Shabbos, I like Shabbos. This Shabbos, let's begin to thank God. You know, Rabbi Rick here always says, you know, be grateful, be grateful. Rick, Rick Taylor, sorry. Rick Taylor says, be grateful for all, for all that God's done for you. And it opens your heart wider to receive. And still ask, ask big, you know. Ask big. Especially when your attitude is, or your, your, your focus. When, when others become your focus, you can start asking big. My heart has expanded when I began to pray for you instead of just me. See, when I do this every night, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Because it's getting... Getting my own, own, you know, navel, you know, who cares about, I, God's taking good care of me. God will take good care of me. I, I, and, and you know what? And the, But I tell you what, when I start pouring out for others, there's things that come like happiness and joy and strength. And, and when you use your life for others, it's amazing how fast God will heal you, even if you're attacked severely. Oh, yeah. Well, what about my Uncle Fred? I don't know about your Uncle Fred and why he died of the, or where, or whoever. And then I'm not saying that is, <clears throat> why does it not happen sometimes? I don't have the answer for that. You'll find out one day. One thing I know though, you better forgive. You better forgive God. You better understand God did the very, all he could for good for that person. And we don't know everything. We don't know why Satan came in and stole. We don't know the deep things in their heart. We don't know many things we don't know. And when we don't know, we have to trust and love anyway. Yes, have you been through tragedy? Well, welcome to the club. But you don't have to stay in a place of bitterness or uh, anger or, uh, you know, or jealousy. Or, you know what, that's no place for a child of God to, to live. You don't stay in depression. That's not who you are. That's not where you're gonna be. I, you turn, you begin to start thanking God. Start thanking God. 
and then amazingly you increase god is all about increasing you i mean to where you have a carriage with eight horses and you just had a old shack before you know <laughs> when god god god's able to do in one day greater than and give to those who ask you give and it shall be given you know always put put uh spiritual things first always hallelujah put god first and god will put you first so very often when we don't receive in prayer, the Bible, why, why does the Bible say we don't receive? It says in James, we don't receive because we ask amiss. Something isn't right. It's like, it's like a, a, the combination that unlocks the answer was not completely accurate. And it all has to do with our hearts. And we have to ask God, when, when things don't go right, or when, when something happens, I say, Lord, what, where did I miss it? What did I do? I know this isn't you. Where? And sometimes, sometimes people don't, if, if there's a terminal disease, say, and it's something that is rapidly taking the life of, of a loved one, or yourself, say, uh, there's a race against time. Satan has hidden the combination. He's hidden where the door opened and he's, he's able to see. And unless, I mean, hit the deck, you know, as soon as there's something, Lord, where, what, what, please show me, show me, show me what I, what I need to do so I can adjust, so I can receive. God's not the one up there, you know, squirting people with guns just because a squirt gun of blessing or healing just because he thinks oh you have a nice shirt on today oh i like that prayer shawl i think i will no that's not god god is absolutely perfect and absolutely loving and absolutely righteous and always has mercy and the best for you that is the character of god and he never changes god is a good god the devil's a bad devil. But where the, you have to search your hearts, and most of the time, is it, most of the time it's in this realm of uh, forgiveness, and it's in this realm of, of, of surrender. And uh, if we're trapped in a place where we're, you know, and you have to hear from God in situations like that. And, uh, but God, where, where is it? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Does that mean that, no, I'm not saying anything specific about anybody. I'm just saying that we all miss it in life. And it's very easy. It's very easy. You can't, for example, it's very hard to see pride. I can't see it. I, I, it blinds me. A person in pride is blind. A person that doesn't know, doesn't, uh, you know, the person is not aware they're in an area that has opened the door for the devil to bring the curse. Well, we, that's why we have to come back every day. If there is a revelation I think is unique right now or something that God has, has put on me to share with the dear ones, it's this. It's, it's that every day, humble yourself. And what? He will lift you up. You see that man, even, I, mean, I know it's not scripture, but it's, it's a good godly story. It has a moral to it. So uh, that man, Moisha, uh, that poor, faithful, kind Jew, right? He gave to God ever, until there was no more to give. That was like a test from Remember Job? Job? Have you seen my servant Job? God says to Satan. <laughs> and sometimes these extremes, see, God knows what's in your heart. And what's in your heart always comes out. What's inside always gets to the outside. It always does for good or evil. And we want to, we want God to daily cleanse and wash us. 
Go before him, for he's gracious and merciful. And if you are in a place of captivity, God's desire is to turn our captivity, just like he did Job. Yeah. And when he turns it, the amazing thing about God is when he restores. Have you been stolen from by the devil? Have you been left on the side of the road half dead, like the, the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan? If people despise and pass you by, well, there's somebody there. You go find somebody that's half dead on the side of the road and you give everything you can to help that person. Like he is the Messiah himself. You know what happens? <laughs> when you sow honor, you reap favor. That man Moishla, as he walked out or out into the forest and then he walked back, he became a magnet for the supernatural because he emptied himself to where he could receive on a, a, a level that he could never receive before. Why? Because he gave on a level he had never given before. And God's able, and God despises a vacuum. It will not stay that way. The universe despises a fact, or not despise it, it. In other words, that God will be no man's debtor. I'm telling you, that's a loan to God. And you watch a person like that, they won't stay down that long. Or God just says, you know what? It's better you just come home, be with me. And that's better. To die is gain. We win no matter what. And even if I had to go down right now, if I had to switch with someone that had some terminal situation and I had so many weeks to live or whatever, I'd still be the same. I'd go, I'd, I'd, even if I went down, I'd go fighting. I'd go s proclaiming, I am the healed of the Lord. I broke, my God always heals. My God always delivers. He is faithful. I don't blame God. Why? He's not the one, he's not the guilty one. <laughs> See, so you've got to get these, these resentments and these things. You've got to ask God to cleanse you, pull it out of you by the blood. Pull out all, all of the bitterness and the hatred and the thorns and the rocks in your soil. I'm going to talk about Mark 4 one day soon. My goodness, what a revelation there is in that. And then when you plant you have bumper crops because there's nothing hindering the harvest. So we've got to get the things out that block, block God from lifting us into that realm of sonship and kingship. We, I am a king, you know, but I'm also a love slave. I'm Paul, the apostle, the head, the greatest of them all. I'm also, I tell you what, hit, Hit, go as low as you can go and serve everybody all the time. And after a while, you can't be hid. After a while, a person like that, the cream always rises to the top. And the devil, when he, when he attacks somebody like that, he's getting ready to get egg on his face. Because the next time you see them, when God restores... Consider the end of Job. He gives twice what he had, or seven times more. Or whatever. The thing that we have to do is qualify. How do you qualify? <laughs> Become the least of these and serve everyone like everyone. Like, that's Jesus coming into my life. How I treat them is how I treat Jesus. My God. Help me, Lord. That's where, that's where the super, super abundant life is. That's where it's at. God will never be in debt to a person like that. Well, that was, I call it hot off the press. Just, God was just giving us some goodies. <laughs> revelation, heavy, heavy revelation. All right, listen, I'm going to, oh my goodness. Is it eight o'clock? Oh, well, we started late. That's right. So it's been about an hour and a half. I think you have a wonderful night.
a wonderful Shabbos. I like saying Shabbos. That was what Rabbi Shlomo would say, Shabbos, Shabbos Shabbat. See, in different areas, they, different uh, parts of Europe and Eastern, the Ashkenazi, this is the Ashkenazi, there's two divisions. There's the Spanish Sephardic, and then there's the uh, Eastern European, Russian Jewish, uh, Eastern European Jewish, uh, Russian, uh, primarily those are the Ashkenazi Jews. Well, uh, they have different ways of saying, uh, they have different language, but there's something beautiful in it. I, I like particularly of the, the, uh, the this uh, part of, this part of the Chabadniks, you know, the, they, they got, they got the, they got the schmaltz, they got it. And, you know, these, the, there's something, see, God, I'll tell you, I know what it is. I have a spirit of revelation, so I actually know what it is. What it is is, see, God sees generationally. He sees what the fathers did before you, and he blesses the sons. He blesses the descendants. Why do we have such an amazing uh, abundance here in America, even in this thing? I mean, you know, it, it's, 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 I mean, I, America is, is a, a stunning, but have you ever read books like The Grapes of Wrath? Have you ever read uh, those, our ancestors and what they went through to settle this land and the price they paid, the price in revival, the, 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 uh, the price in the church and the spirit realm and in the natural, the, the Great Depression, my, uh, our, uh, my mother in love, uh, I call her, uh, mom who lives with us, she's 90, almost 92 now, 91. Is she 92? I don't know. Anyway, but uh, she remembers the Great Depression. She was a little child. Uh, and, she, and to this day, because of what she went through growing up, she tends to, you've seen that with older people, they'll, they'll, they'll hoard things, or they'll, they'll, and she'll say, even even recently, she she won't. She said, "Don't throw out the food. Don't throw out any food, because I might need this. Put this in, you know." And we don't know the kind of deprivation that those that went before us faced and how they overcame that. God, God knows, and He promised. America, a time of harvest. See, that's whenever God blessed Israel, whenever we came, went through good times, what happened? We turned away from God and turned to idols every time. Then when it was really rough, <laughs> in the book of Judges, it'd get really bad. We would cry out and then God would send a deliverer and he always would send a man. And that is what the that is what the prophet's ministry is all about. He'll send someone. He'll raise up someone. I think God raised up Donald Trump with all of his, all of his things. But God put a deliverer's anointing on him to save America. Isn't that amazing? Well, I don't like him. Sweetheart, you're not the one. You, you might have voted him. You might, we may have voted him in down here. Did that... God chooses whom he decides to choose. If he wants to choose somebody. But when, also notice in this story how the, 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 the Talmudim or the disciples of the Baal Shem, uh, how they were taught to honor, honor anyone. The honor, so honor, always always so honor and blessing into the Baal Shem, into, and, and whoever, you know, and whoever gives to you, whoever honors you, who, especially if that person is, uh, God has sent them into your life and you know it. See, but we are not an honoring culture. Our, we are dishonored. That's one of the, that as a whole, that's the, in the last days, heroes, times will come, men will come lovers of themselves, dishonorable, 
not honoring their parents, not honoring authority, despising those who do good. And, and the way God really blesses us is when we recognize and open our hearts to God and then give into, into that in every way you can. Honor. And the Lord one time said to me, honor everybody like they're me. Now, I haven't attained to this, especially ones the home test is the hardest. Honor your spouse. Honor your parents. Honor those in spiritual authority over you. Honor them. Believe. Don't speak against them. Don't judge them. Just, just treat them like they're Jesus. But they're not. I know they're not. But he, there, Jesus in him, and God has set you there. See, when God puts you somewhere, then you stay put until he puts you somewhere else. That's the way he works. It's not negotiable. But I don't like it. You're going to go through times that you're not going to like it to deal with difficult people. But God uses those times to really bless you. And, and you know what? I believe right now, this is what I sense right now, as I'm going to finish finish here. I'm kind of going on. Uh, uh, sometimes these end codas, uh, codas on a symphony or a piece of music, that it's a, just the tail end, you know, and, and it's something God blesses. Uh, but sometimes they get more out of that than the, the main part. Because uh, you're then uh, in ministry, you step over into the mind of Messiah and God will start speaking prophetically to individuals and give you different nuggets and hallelujah. So if I tarry, <laughs> that's because, because God's so in love with you, he wants to fill you with as much as he possibly can. That's why. The love of Messiah constrains me to bless you and not to judge you. You see, so believe the best of everyone. And the way you do that, is just keep feeding, keep feeding on the good promises of God until that divine nature, that nature of love, just get, you just get baptized in it. I mean, until it just overtakes you. It overtakes you. And I tell you what, as soon as that happens, the devil just packs his bags and leaves because that's what gives you the authority to drive him out. That's it. He doesn't, he doesn't go for anything else. You gotta actually have the goods. But when you, have, when, when you get into the place where you're really operating just like God, because God is the most loving, merciful, giving being in the universe, and he's long suffering, then that's, when the love of God and the compassion takes over, that's where the supernatural is. That's where God comes and he does the miracles. He does great miracles all the time. He's constantly. We just have to, we have to get into that place of being yielded to God. You know, uh, I, I probably heard Pastor Benny quote Catherine Coleman, uh, dozens of times with this thing. And, and he would say, he would say, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit Conference, I found the actual video where she said it. You can find it. Some of you know about it. Uh, in 1974, I think. And she was, she was saying, God is not asking for golden vessels. And her finger would come like this. God, he's not asking for silver vessels. He's asking for yielded vessels. Abandon yourself moment by moment to be led by the love of God. That's where the abundant life is. And we'll keep saying it to you over and over and over and over and keep, just keep depositing it in you because hallelujah, this is not just for a few saints that broke through, no. This is for the whole body of Messiah. This is the place of the bride. This is the bridal company. You just, you didn't tell me you need to get in the spiritual elevator and go up about a hundred floors. 
<laughs> Come up here. Live here. Look at things. Let Jesus just totally take you over. Lock, stock, and barrel. Take you over. Hook, line, sinker. Fisherman. Boots. Pole. Boat and lake. Just swallow it whole. Swallow the whole thing. I'm all in. I want, this is it. This is it. This is all I want. From now on, your wish is my command, sir. You know, I was listening to, I like Kenneth Copeland. I really do. I'm not saying, you know, he's called to do a specific thing, but he's helped me very much over the years. I'll tell you, and I don't mind saying that. Uh, I'm not called to minister in that same area like he does, but I am called, that is, I believe in the message of faith. I believe, and he's a good man, but he was saying, I sometimes God will lead me to watch his broadcast, and he's out back of his house there, you know, this week and talking about, so I think it was a couple of days ago, and he, he mentioned something. He said, he said, now don't get mad at me because I like Brother Copeland. I, he's, he's not false. He's not, no. He's not a, a false teacher. He really isn't. He's called to bring victory to God's people. Anyway, I don't want to talk about that. Stop, stop. Stop judging. Get out of the judging business. Well, I can judge doctrine. Well, most of your doctrine isn't right either. That's the problem. If you're warped, you'll see warped. Maybe you're the one that's, that needs to be straightened out. Straighten your board out. Then you'll see straight. Maybe you're warped with religious hatred. You ever thought about that? Stay out of the judging business. You get in trouble when you judge. That kind of judging. Now, I believe in judging false doctrine. But this man is not in false doctrine. He's just emphasizing the area he's called to emphasize. All right, so anyway. Uh, wow. Oh, boy. Well, I hit somebody's nerve right there. Don't, don't get mad at me. And besides, I don't claim perfection. Uh, and you're on my broadcast, I'm not on yours. You're on my page, I'm not on your page. So you can just start your own then if you're so high and mighty and you know everything. Be careful with that realm. Be careful, be careful, be careful. All right, so anyway, uh, uh, well, what did he say? Oh, shoot, that was so good. He was talking about, oh my, I lost my train of thought. See, I, I, I'm hooked up with you and you, you know, and then when the offense rises up, it affects me. You actually hindered, that, uh, that offense hindered the flow of revelation right there. Don't do that. You know what that is? Pride, pride, pride. Humble yourself. You don't know it all. You know, a man used to say, you can't teach a know-it-all anything. Well, that's not all of them. And just, anyway, I get, I get into this flow, but there's something so special here. The father was pleased when I read that story. I think, I think he was. But God looks at things a lot different than Christian religion does. God looks at everything different. And you know, in order, in order to do that, you have to ascend. You have to send, ascend in your perception, your understanding. Most of all, you have to get you won't see things clearly and straight until you absolutely get saturated in the love of God. Stay out of the ditches. Don't take the bait of Satan. The bait of Satan is offense. And when you listen to somebody, remember, they're just as, they're just as, uh, just like you. We're doing our best. I'm a broken human being whom God put back together. And 
In faith, I am together in him. But I still have this treasure in earth and vessels. So none of us can claim the infallibility of Jesus. None of us. And in fact, as soon as somebody does, run. Get out of there. Be careful, because as soon as that happens, that person, their heart gets hard, and then nobody can tell them anything. Well, I want to have people be able to tell me I want to be corrected. I need to be corrected. But God's very able to do that. The Holy Spirit within me corrects me every day and tells me, but he does it with love. I don't need, I don't need uh, uh, Judas's and, you know, uh, that type of correction. That's demonic. Religion has killed every, Jesus every time it sees him. Every time it crucifies him. Every time. So I'm very well aware of who's on my side and who's not. By God's grace, I can spot you. I can smell you five miles away. Smelling is a discerning gift. It's one of our spiritual senses. <laughs> all right. Where am I getting into all that for? Why am I? Anyway, listen, I, it was so positive and wonderful today. So let's end on that note, okay? And I love you. And, uh, you know, God turn, has been turning up the power on these broadcasts, especially in the last week or two. Whoa. And uh, you know what happens when you turn a bright light on in the south, in Louisiana, down in the bayou, share. Mm -hmm. You'll attract every bug, and bugs you never thought could possibly exist will suddenly, big giant ones, will start to buzz around you. How do you deal with that? Hallelujah, wisdom. See, thank God I'm not just it's not, um, this kind of love is not um, milk toast um, uh, when someone walks all over you type. What's, it's not that type of love because religion will, ha, has no power over. See, I also bear the sword. Why? I have weapons. See, America is compassionate and extremely giving as a nation, but we are also armed. If we weren't armed, Israel the same way. If we're not armed, we could be destroyed. And I tell you what, when the power gets turned up, the devil wants to destroy the whoever or wherever it's coming from. It's too, too, too bright, too much, too much. Well, guess what? I don't care. I know you. I know how to handle you. And uh, you can't succeed as my enemy. That's one thing that I heard Kenneth Copeland say many years ago. I'll love you, but I'm not going to, I am not going to uh, yield any ground in the spirit that God has given me. I'm staying right here, and I know what I'm doing. Even though I know very little, I know how to stand and break religious devils and smash them into little pieces. Yeah, I know how, I know how to do it, and I do it every day, every day, every day. That's why I overcame enough to get to you so I could get to the love, so I can love you without being destroyed and taken out, even by a stomach uh, problem or fatigue or whatever it was. The important thing is it was, it left. You know, both, we, need, we need the armor of God. We need to understand how the devil fights. Give him no place. Resist him. And the love of God is the biggest weapon of them all. 
The love of God will draw you right out of the religious garbage, right into the truth that will set you free. And, and hallelujah. And you'll live in a realm that you never believed existed. Never knew. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, listen, I'm going to say good night. <laughs> and I've got to move this down so I can get to the finish button on the... I have this iPad thing, and it, it's on a stand, and I can read to you a little easier without looking down. And then before I didn't get upset because she don't want people to see my hair. Oh, well. But I'm, I got to... Y'all pray for me. I do that, whatever it is, so I can grow my hair back. God, God can grow it back, can he? Oh, thank you for your, your hearts. Your love. I love hearts. That's sweet. And now, tonight, uh, I am going again, about a couple hours from now, 1030. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, I have to put a disclaimer there. Unless Devorah has something she needs me to do. And I, sometimes a little later, but 1030, I'm going to pray for everyone and ask God to bless you. And I'm gonna bless you now. But if you need a prayer, you need agreement in prayer, that this is actually more effective than if I opened it all up with Zoom and, you know, people start praying and telling them, and then once they get on, it's, you know, 20 minutes about their long lost uncle and Uncle Fred and, and Aunt Susie and, and her goldfish. Well, we don't need that. We need we need, you need prayer, and you need release of the anointing, you need agreement, and you need, um, you need answers. And I, I'm after, I'm after you receiving from God. So I'm going to agree with you, and then I hold it. I just lock it in, I won't let go. So, and uh, that's what I do at night, and I just bless you. If you don't, you say something nice to me that blesses me, I'll, if you're really touched, I'll put a put a red heart there or a care one or whatever, because I am touched and I do care. And you are very special to me. It's not romantic kind of love, but it's a higher love. It's a it's a if you ever get even a glimpse of how much God is head over heels, teenage crush type bonkers in love with you. You, you, you just do the Snoopy dance. You'll just, you, you'll be so happy. You, you, you are loved. <laughs> and you're going to be all right. So when fear loses its hold of you, only the love of God and you knowing and believing in that love casts out the fear. Yeah, casts out the fear. Yes, and God wants to bless you financially. He wants to bless you in every way. He wants to give you peace of mind. He wants you to stop fretting and worrying and stop watching the news all the time. I limit my news to 10 minutes. I just find out, okay, have they, has the world blown itself up yet? Well, no, not yet. Okay, and if I need to know something, believe me, if it's something big enough, you'll find out about it. Somebody will tell you. Okay, so you know events. But don't sit there and feed on all that crap. That's what it is. Don't fill your spirit with fear and worry and fretting and and pandemic and I call it pastemic. I'm just I'm done with it. I'm just I just went on. I'm just going on. I'm past it's in the past now as far as I'm concerned. Let America go. Let my people go. I tell you, the real war is getting them to let go of their hold of control. And I'm, I am concerned about that. And I'm, you know, we're gonna have to pry their little filthy hands off of our country. You're not gonna take America over yet. I'm not done yet, says the Lord. It's a great harvest to come in. This is our finest hour, not our quarantine hour. Time to come out. Let's get up and get on with our business. And every time 
Satan tries to thwart the Church of the Living God, we'll just burst out a hundred times more in another area. That's what's happened. The devil's lost in this thing. He's lost thousands and even millions of souls because they, the hearts get tender and then the gospel goes out and here comes the harvest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a good time to be alive. It really is. So I'm going to release. I just got zapped with a new dose of victory today. Got back up, got out of my bed just like Aeneas, take up your bed, <laughs> get out of bed, <laughs> rise up, be healed, be made whole. And he got up. I got up. I got up. Hallelujah. I'm fine. No symptoms. I feel great. So then it's possible, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you. May the Lord fill you with his precious Holy Spirit. And may he give you shalom with nothing missing, nothing broken. I release the blessings of my fathers upon you. And I release the blessings of Abraham upon you. I release the blessing of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah. Be blessed, be empowered to prosper. May God win through you tonight, this Shabbos. Now rest in him and worship him. Turn off the TV and turn on the God channel. <laughs> God Turn on, open your word, worship him. All right, well, <clears throat> I made it to two hours, didn't I? You know, Rabbi Rick said to me, he said, how do you know what to say? I, how, how do you get on like that every day? I said, I don't know, it just pours out of me. I don't know, I don't know what to say most of the time. I hope it is a blessing to you. And if I prepare it, God usually says, no, nah, I got a better meal. He said, I'm a better cook than you. I said, yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. All right. This beautiful song, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Father. And we ask for the safety and the blessing of the nation of Israel. We pray for the Jewish people, our people, throughout the world. Oh Lord, bring us home. Bring us back to our land, the land of our fathers. Cause us to restore everything that has been stolen from us. And most of all, Father, open our eyes that we may receive Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Holy One, the soon coming king. Hallelujah. Oh, this is so beautiful. I'm going to turn it up just for a minute. This is with my friends singing, the opera singers. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. They're from Vienna. Oh, beautiful. Have the same. I bless all the dear ones. Hallelujah. Bless you. Amen. 
Haleluya. Oh, I heard the say just a little longer. Yes, sir. I, of course. He's just, we hit a gusher here. What's it? Oh, yes. I, I play an improvisation here. This is, oh, no. This is not. No, there, I, wait, hold on. Oh, that's a nice one. Shav Tem Mayim, 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 living water, 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 spring up a oh well. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is a wonderful CD, by the way. Uh, in some ways, I like it. I, I needed a CD that that was rejoicing songs for Israel. And I had a more solemn, well, solemn one. This, this is... And what I did was I did this kind of like a duet CD. There's two parts because originally it belonged to Ben and Vera uh, Carlson and my friend, uh, my arranger, my late arranger, Larry Dalton did this with the London Philharmonic. And you know, Ben and Vera said, take this and use it. I said, wow, what a gift. God bless them. And so we made a CD. Uh, and, but it's duet. It's both Ben and Bear. It's an operatic CD. I put both parts on the violin. So you'll hear two violins. <laughs> All right, I just want to play this to end with. This is an improvisation on... Whoops. Oh, it's almost over. Sorry. When I try to do it, it's not as good as if I let the Holy Spirit do it, right? Well, this is an improvisation on the Aaronic benediction. This is actually sung uh, by, but this is an improvisation on the violin. What I what I speak over and pray over you. So, let's end with this today. The devil paid today for what he did to me. <laughs> he paid. We got you off. You got him off of you. You're free. You're free. You're free.
coming soon for my people have suffered for so long for so long for so long day and night I have walked with you through the valley of the shadow of death now she dawns, the day has dawned, the morning comes. I will follow you, I will keep you, I will shield you from all harm. The days grow dark, but I am there. Greater is he that is in you. I know that shame has come and despair, but greater is the one that is in you. I've come to give you life, I've come to give you health, I've come to give you blessing, I've come to give you peace, I've come to bring joy for sorrows, I've come to bring wholeness out of brokenness. You shall receive. This Shabbos, this Shabbos, this Shabbos, you shall receive joy, fullness of joy. I am lifting up, lift up your heads, lift up your heads, lift up your eyes to me. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Bless you, dear ones. Never did that before. Not quite like that. Hallelujah. It was wonderful. Well, Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow and we will we will have the Havdalah. We'll end the Shabbos. We'll end the Shabbat. Now that's a messianic service. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, God help me with that one. Glory. Oh, thank you, Lord. I got blessed. I hope you did too. You know, when you when you just stand against the devil, when he tries to screaming at you, you can't do it. I'll stop you. You can't do this, Rodka. You can't get out of bed. You can't. Oh, but then when you do it anyway, hallelujah. That's when, that's when Satan's power is broken. 
When Jesus comes, Satan's power is broken. When Jesus comes, he wipes the tears away. <laughs> oh, yes. <sighs> victory, 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 victory. We'll take them by land. We'll take them by sea. We'll take them by air. There's no substitute. I smell the smell of victory. I, I see the enemy crushed under my foot. What a day. Let the weak say, I am strong. I am strong. I am strong. I'm a part of the army of the Lord. And I'm marching, marching, marching to Zion. I'm marching, marching on to Zion. <laughs> and I'm there too. Ooh, can you taste it? Can you hear the sound of victory? I can taste it. I can, I'm there. My head broke through. And I can smell the fragrance of heaven. Can you hear and can you see out of the storm there's victory, pure victory, victory. Hallelujah. The victory serum has been injected into the blood of Jesus and flowing in my veins now. I hear the sound of marching of the army to Zion, the heavenly army walking by our side. And the angels say things like, it's an honor, sir, to walk beside a child of the king who used his weapons and set your generation free. Oh, yes. The littlest is the biggest with God. Just stand up and believe and walk on anyway. March on anyway. It's not over yet. Your life isn't over yet. Hallelujah. Glory. All right. I have to say good night. Have a wonderful Shabbos. See you tomorrow, 5 o'clock, Lord willing. West Coast time, 5 o'clock. Pacific Standard Time. And if you miss it or you don't come on, then you can always watch it later. You can always go back and watch it later. So I love you. Good night. Shalom, Shabbat Shalom.